having me come. I, I, it's just a privilege to be here in um, Auckland. I love this city. It's so pretty. It really yeah. is. But and so after hearing all those amazing women share their hearts, I'm thinking, what have I got to say? <laughs> but um, no, really, thank you, girls. It, it was amazing just to hear your your stories and your life, and just how God has made such a difference mm -hmm. to it. And um, yeah, I I'm going to speak about that today. Um, obviously the um, the title of, of this, this time together as women is called Radiant. And the scripture that is used uh, for, for the, uh, the, the title of today is in Psalm 34 verse, I like to start in verse 4 because it really actually puts verse 5 into, into context because this is it here. <laughs> it says in verse 4, it says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered in shame. I think the thing I love about the whole thing about fear is I think that a lot of us as women can relate to that. And I really appreciate just the sisters that actually shared their hearts because you see that, that you know, the battles that they were, they were having with fear of a lot of things in their life. And that's what I love about this scripture. If you want, if you've got a Bible and you want to read that whole psalm, it is amazing, but also it really does put into context the fact that God is the one that makes us radiant. So I really just want to share a little bit about that today. Um, the definition of the word radiance is living in light, shining bright with joy and hope, shining from the inside out. Opposite to radiant is darkness. You know, um, it, is, it is not what is on the outside that makes you radiant, it comes from what is within. You know, beaming, shining, sparkling, all these words that de define the word radiant. Also, when I love to think about people that are radiant, I see confidence. Um, you know, everybody that I, I, I look at that I feel like, well, what a confident woman, you can see radiant, you can see the radiance in their life. You know, also happy. Always something I've always, is, is who I am. I love to be happy. I don't know about you, but happiness is something that I've always strive, you know, strive to be in my life. So I've done many things. I've gone traveling. I've done, I've just all what the girls were sharing, all these things to help me to be happy in my life. But actually what I figured out, happiness and radiance does not depend on your circumstances. It depends on what is within you. You know, when I think of something that's radiant, of course I think of the sun. I think that it, I, I love the sun. It just makes... I think there's a freedom when it's sunny. You know, there's just a freedom to life. You can do what you want. You don't have to run around trying to, you know, keep, not get wet and all this sort of stuff. I love it. I love the summertime because it really makes me feel alive. I think that's another thing that being radiant is. It makes you feel alive. But how can we live lives like this? In John 10.10, 10, it says, I have come that they may have life and life to the full. The words of Jesus, the reason he came was to give every single one of us life and life to the full. As an older woman, I know that this is, is something that I've strived after for a long time. And I really believe I found it in becoming a Christian and staying a Christian. It's not mm. easy. Mm. The world and life just gets harder, honestly, as you get older. But, you know, really, I don't, I'm not someone who wants to exist. I want to live life to the full. And that is what I have with God. And I think the world promises it, but it doesn't deliver. The real true radiance and life that we can have is only through God. But you know what? What defines you? What would your friends say define you? What would your family say defines you? What would you say defines you? What would you say God says defines you? You know, I love this scripture, and I want to tell you how God defines you. This is in the Psalms, and it's written by King David, one of the guys who, who um, the Bible says that God said, he's a man after my own heart. And so when David wrote something, you could see that it was from the heart of God. It says, in Psalm 139, it says, Paul, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Is that the way you see yourself? 
You know, a lot of us as women, we don't see ourselves that way. We compare ourselves to other people. We see what the world says we should be and try to become that way. But this is the way God created you to be, to be radiant, to be full of life, to be really, really confident in who you are because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's what I love about being a Christian. The world tells you that you're useless and unless you look a certain way, you don't actually add up. You know, the way certain things, you know, if you don't have certain things, if you don't think certain things, if you're not going with the flow and becoming like everybody else, you're not accepted. You know, you're not beautiful. You're not worth anything. And you know, that is what we can really latch on to as women in the world, to really define who we are. You know, I want to share with you today about a woman, and the women in the Bible are my, one of my favorite subjects to read. And I, I want to just encourage you, if you've never really studied out the women in the Bible, it is an amazing study on just real women who became more than what they thought they could be because of God in their life. And it is incredible. I want to share about a woman who really helped me at a time in my life when I was really struggling with what I really wanted out of life. It was a struggle between being a Christian and going back to be just like my, you know, be back to the world with my friends and to go back to the life that I left because I never found happiness in that. But she was an incredible woman that lived in the time of the, of, uh, the Persian king Xerxes and she was the Jewish queen. And she was uh, the wife, you know, Xerxes, he sought a new wife after his first queen was arrogant and disrespectful to him. And Esther was chosen. She was an amazing young woman. She was an orphan who was adopted by her cousin. And she was 14 years old when she was chosen to go into the harem of the king. You know, the king's advisor, I'll just give you a little bit of background so you're going to get a little bit of what I'm saying in the, the points I have just to really show you just what an incredible woman this girl was you know the chief's advisor he had offended Esther's cousin he was offended by him and his name was Mordecai the guy that was offensive to the to the king's assistant and he gets permission to from the king to actually kill all the Jews living in the kingdom of Persia at that time and Esther was a Jew, <laughs> you know, and she actually is the one that stopped the whole plan that he had. And he was, she was actually given them, she actually helped the king give them permission to actually kill the people that were going to kill her. <coughs> Esther became a radiant light to her people, not because of her beauty, not because of who she was, but because of her relationship with God. No, there's three points I have, three quick points that um, I really love about this woman. And the first one was Esther did not let her beauty define her. Okay. Um, this young woman in Esther chapter 2 verse 7, and if you have a Bible at home and you want to read the story, fantastic story to read. Um, just to really understand this a little bit more, and I think you'll probably get a lot <coughs> out of it if you do read the whole story in itself. But in Esther chapter 2 verse 7, it says, This young woman, who was also known as Esther, <laughs> had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother had died. She was a, an exceptionally beautiful girl, very noticed by a lot of people, and therefore was chosen to be amongst the king's harem. And he did not know she was actually was a Jew. But actually the world at that time of the Babylonians, that's where the, all the beauty um, products, all the cosmetics, all the oils started to be used on all of the women at that time. And that is what they defined <laughs> as beautiful. So in, it says in, in um, chapter 2, just going on a little further, it says before any young woman came to the king, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women. Six months with oil and myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. You know, they tried to change the way she looked to suit their cultural interpretation of beauty, just like our world tells us today. Have you bought into those lies? And you know, some of us will say, no, no, I'm confident, but deep down, really, I know for me, I still 
look at that. I still want to be like, oh man, I just want to look good. I just want to, people to think I'm, I'm attractive in some way or another. And I don't think that, that I, I'm alone there. And I'm deep in my fifties. <laughs> you know, but I just feel like, wow, the world tells us we need to be a certain way. And even back here, they would use the cosmetics to even make this beautiful young woman look a certain way. You know, what we look like matters. It does to the world. I don't know about you, but if you have social media, you see just all the things that people put up on social media. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you've got to ask yourself, yeah, is that really true? Because it's funny, because some people I see the, on social media, they're like they're having a blast in life. You know, they're traveling here and they're swimming here and they're doing this here. And then I'm like, and I, you know, then, then I talk to them and I'm like, wow, wow, your social media does not really actually add up to what you're saying <laughs> you know we try to portray something to the world why because what we look like matters it matters to us it matters to our self-esteem and it matters to people that you know we want we want them to think we're having a great life when really sometimes we're not you know the internet i think since the world has become smaller and we know what's going on everywhere you know, we, it makes life more competitive. I feel like life today is a lot harder than it was when I was a kid. I didn't care, I didn't know anybody. You know, you only knew your social circles, you only knew who you went to school with, you didn't hear what was going on in, you know, England and Paris and all these other places, America, especially America, you know. But I love the scripture in the Bible that says, the more knowledge, the more grief. That is such a true scripture. And I think it really applies to a lot of us. And you know, sometimes I'm just like, don't let me look at the news. I don't know if you watch the news. But when I watch the news, I'm like, oh my gosh, this world is sad. And it makes it push you down. The more knowledge, the more grief. And the, you know what the world is striving after more and more? I want to know. I want to know. I want to know what's going on here. And you know, even in me, in the morning sometimes I'm like, okay, so pick up my phone, quick, what's going on in the world? You know, I don't know if you do that. I do. <laughs> but you know, I have to really stop that sometimes because it really sets my mindset to be something that I don't want it to be. You know, reality TV shows, you know, I never watch TV anymore because they are the saddest things on earth. <laughs> you know, and one thing that, you know, I know my daughter when she was younger, she always used to watch that show, Keeping Up with the Kardashians. <laughs> I'm just like, why? Why are you even watching that? But even the name of it just gives that it gives young women this whole thing. I have to be like her. I have to keep up with her. Why? She's beautiful. Why? She's popular. Why? She's rich. She's a celebrity. Everybody loves her. And so that's what young women strive after because they want to keep up with the Kardashians. Man, that's a sad thing in itself. But that is what the world is teaching us today. Compare yourself. You feel like you're not good enough because these people are just so far beyond what we would even think we could become. Yeah. You know, in a study conducted in 2010, worldwide in first world countries, 35% of people said they felt their appearance defined their identity. In 2015, that number jumped to 50%. So in five years, now half of, the, of young people that were actually, you know, surveyed said that their, uh, their appearance defines who they are, their identity. You know, so it makes sense that now almost two thirds of people now say that they work hard at their appearance. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's really nice to look great. But when our appearance defines, our appearance defines who we are, that is where it starts to go wrong. You know, 61% of men and women think that their lives would be better if they were more attractive. You know, 41% of millennials have felt better about themselves because someone else looks worse than them, in their opinion. But you know what? I think we can all relate to that, right? When you walk into a room and you think you look good, hey, you feel good, right? I know. Yeah, man. You know? Yeah. Right? Yeah, man. Exactly. And, you know, and I think, you know, we've got to feel good about ourselves, but we can't let that be the thing that defines us. Because that is what the world says. It's very, very superficial when really radiant, being radiant comes from the inside up out. Who you are. You know, I love that about her. She did not, Esther did not let her, her beauty define her. She let her humility 
departs. <coughs> you know, it says in the same chapter, a little further on, it says, when the time came for Esther, the young woman that Mordecai had adopted, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what the king's servant was giving for her. You know, because when you're in a situation like that, it's easy to ask for a lot of things. You can ask <coughs> anything you want to. But she was humble. She was like, no, you give me what you think. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her because she wasn't entitled. She was humble. You know, humility is a characteristic uncherished in the world today, but highly cherished by God. Even though she was physically beautiful and in her, and it, it was her inner beauty that made her attractive, it was that what made her radiant from the inside <coughs> out. You know, the Bible does say, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And I really feel like this is what happened to this woman. As a result of Esther letting God's values be the center of her life, her life was radiant and noticed by all those around her. And it even says in verse 17, now the king was attracted to Esther more than all of the other women. And I'm sure she was not only the most, she, she was beautiful, but maybe she wasn't the most beautiful. It was what, who she was that, was that made her attractive. And I love that about her. She didn't let her beauty define her. And the second thing that she didn't do, she didn't let her fears define her. Mm -hmm. You know, fear is a powerful thing. And that's why even this scripture, it says that, you know, if we trust in God, that, you know, he will make us radiant. We do not need to worry about that. Fear is powerful. It paralyzes you. It makes you just think about you. You know, fear makes you want to protect yourself. It stops you being you. And you don't want, you know, because you don't want to be different. I know that's a lot of things that go on in the, 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 you know, the minds of young women. You know, fear, fear stops us achieving our dreams in life. You know, they can also stop us from making the right decisions at the crucial times. You know, another thing that, um, you know, is a very, very, very high in women, young women especially today, is anxiety. And um, you know what anxiety actually is? It's the stress or uneasiness of mind caused by fear. Fear is the thing that causes anxiety. You know, the percentage of 15 to 24 year olds struggling with anxiety and depression is steadily growing each year. In New Zealand, 12% of people of this age group struggle with this. 12% of young people. Everyone experiences fear and anxiety, but how do you deal with it? You know, put in a very fearful and anxious situation, and have a little look at how Esther dealt with it. In um, at the same chapter, at Esther 2, it says, But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do. For she continued to follow Mordecai's instruction, as she, as she had done as, um, when, she, when he was bringing her up. You know, she was put into a situation where she was a Jew, and all of the Jews were going to be killed. And she was like, okay, so what do I do here? Do I just stay quiet? And just pretend I'm not a Jew? No, it was something that she was like, this big thing came into her life and she was put in a position to be able to do something about it. You know, and she listened to her mentor. Because sometimes when, when we get in that situation, what does fear do? It paralyzes you like, oh, I can't do anything. I can't do anything. But this is what her uncle or her cousin said to her. Do you think that because you are in the king's house alone, you alone, of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come from, from, from the Jews. It will arise from another place, but you and your family will perish. But who knows that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. Imagine her being stuck with this, like, okay, 15 year old girl, you gotta stand up and go to the king and you gotta tell him what's going on. I mean, how would you feel? I mean, I know I would have felt you're anxious, scared, you know, what's going to happen, all these things. But she was called to be brave. Her mentor called her to be brave. Brave women I think I've ever met. And she is in Sydney. I just want to share a little bit about her. Her name is Carmen. And that any of her disciples here know who she is. <laughs> um, she, she came from a Muslim background. She was a Shiite Muslim brought up in Baghdad. 
She was married, she had a little child, and she was studying, she was studying in Sydney. Um, just, you know, she was studying her PhD. And she was really, she was in a very, very hard situation, especially in her marriage and in her, you know, just in her life. And she was looking for something. And one of the guys that in, in the Sydney church stopped her and asked her to come to church. She was a Muslim. And he was like, and she, and she was like, no, nope, don't you call me, don't you come near me. I'm, but she somehow gave us her number, gave, gave it to Tegan actually. <laughs> it was like, it was like, wow. She, but she was scared to give her number, and yet she was really wanting something. But anyway, so we, you know, we became her friends, and she started studying the Bible. And this woman made a decision to become a Christian. She had to change her name. She was putting her child in danger even doing this because of just the fact that she was a Muslim from that background, she was absolutely in danger from, you know, her religion. And she, her bravery was incredible. I don't think I've ever met a woman that has stood up for her own, her own sake and the sake of her son in such a great way. And it's been amazing to see her persevere through many, many challenges of just giving up the cult, not only the culture of, of Iraq, but also her, her religion, which is also a culture, which is Islam. And I'm just like, wow, an amazing woman, an amazing, and if you ever get to meet her and listen to her story, you'll be amazed. But it was incredible to see just a woman that has the faith and the courage because of her faith in God that was a new faith in God to really change. And I just really quickly want to share about two incredible women that I, we were in Samoa last weekend at our inaugural service at our church in Samoa, and it was just incredible. There have been two incredible young women who were baptized over the last few weeks there, and they come from a Methodist background. And they were, you know, they actually started studying the Bible and realized that even though they were going to church, they were brought up in all these ways, their families were, were ministers and pastors within the church, that they weren't actually living like the Bible says. You know, it was really, it was really incredible. They, they were threatened, they were kicked out, they had, you know, were threatened of being disowned and beaten, um, you know, for changing not only their churches, but their beliefs. You know, they had to really battle about putting God above their family and their family taking it extremely personal. I'll never forget Tamu's conviction when talking with her family and her, and her explaining that the only way I can actually love and take care of my family to the extent that I want to is if I choose to love God above them. So yes, I choose to love God first because it's the only one, he's the only one that can love and take care of both me and my family, despite what my family thinks about me. Amazing young woman who, you know, and, and, and these, these women really inspire me. Their bravery and their faith to actually start to, you know, to, to not let their fears define them. Because you know what, going against your family as a young woman is a really big issue. Going against your culture, your religion, as a woman is very, very, it's scary in lots of ways, but these women are my heroes in the faith because of what they've had to persevere through to get to where they are. You know, today, someone's going to ask you if you wanted to study the Bible and put God first. You know, don't say no. Even if you think you know the Bible, you've heard these incredible women that have come from Christian backgrounds and yet, you know, they didn't really know what God called them to be and what God wanted for their life. I was one of them as well. I was traveling the world, having a blast, you know, and thinking I was a Christian all my life until one young lady stepped into my life in London and she showed me the scriptures. And when I looked at that, I was like, wow, I have never seen this before. It changed my life. That was 28 years ago. And it was a bit scary to actually have to change everything that I thought, everything that I believed all my life. But it was amazing to really see the freedom that comes from really knowing God and being radiant because of that. You know, I love Esther. She didn't let her fears define her. The one thing that she did do, though, she let her hope in God define her. You know, hope is a powerful thing. You know, it can it can also be destructive when our hope is in the wrong thing. 
You know, we don't. She didn't put her hope in her secure position. She didn't put her hope in her um, in her beauty. <coughs> she didn't even put her hope in the fact that this guy liked her. She put her hope in God. And you know what? She, when she called to go to the king, she said this to Mordecai. She said, "Go and gather together all the Jews." who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Esther went to God. She put her hope in God. She got everybody turning to God, and that's what happens when, one, when we have the faith to go to God, we affect a lot of people. You know, she came up with a plan on how to really come, you know, to, to come up and save her people. And God honored that. And you can read that when you read, the, when you read her story. You know, it was incredible just to see her come to the king and for the king to really just be able to see her, her um, just, just her real what's it, sincerity. That's the word. Sincerity, just in coming to her about her people. You know, once God revealed to the king the injustice that was put upon the Jews at that time, he allowed the king to bring justice through one woman, and that woman was Esther. You know, life with you know will bring us all challenges in our you know throughout our life. None of us will escape them. The question is not what challenges are going to come into your life, but who will rescue you from those challenges? And you know what, today, there's not a lot of people that will. Today, people put their hope in money, health, husbands, careers, all of this of which will fail. If, you know, they will at some point. But to be faithful to you or the power to rescue you, these people don't have it. But only God has that. It is only God who will make us secure and give us the light to shine in this dark world. No, and I really have had the opportunity to experience this this year. Um, we, uh, like my husband and I, we are uh, we lead the church in Sydney. We've been Christians for around 28, 30 years. And, um, you know, we've given up everything to do what we believe. We sold our house, we've given up we, we've used our money to, to fund our missionary trips, to train, to do what we need to do, to be, you know, to, to be effective for God. It's been an adventure and it's been awesome. But you know, when you get a little older, you're feeling like I need some sort of security in my life. <laughs> and um, you know, a, a few times we've been living in houses and we were told that, you know, you have to move. Because, um, you know, they're renting the house out, they're selling the house, they're doing something. And I was like, you know what, I just want somewhere I don't have to worry that we're going to have to keep moving. And my parents have recently passed away in the last few years, and they lent, they lent us some money. So my husband and I were like, we're going to do this. We're going to, we're going to buy ourselves an apartment in Sydney. Great investment, right? Great security, right? We, that's what we thought. Anyway, so we buy this place. Two months we've had this, but two months. And the, they start building a building next door. So they dig down so deep with this building next door, and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on about the building regulations in Sydney because of this, but they built down too deep. They took, you know, soil from under our building, and what has happened? The whole apartment blocks, there's three blocks within this, are unstable, unlivable. We get this call from our children in Manila. Joe and I are in Manila, you know, just at a conference and, and what happens in Manila? We get this phone call, my kids are like, Mom, they told us to evacuate. I'm like, oh, don't worry, it's just a drill, they do that, you know, don't worry about it, it's fine. And then the next door neighbor came over and um, he was like, no, you need to evacuate. <laughs> And take it, just take what you can, just take what you can. And so, the, so Ali's freaking out. She's my, my, t my kids are 21, both of them. And you know, my son's out walking the dog, and my, my daughter's freaking out. What am I gonna do? I don't know what to do. like, take, just listen, just calm down. Just take, some, take what you need and leave. I'm ringing Jenna. Jenna, can you get in the car and go and get my kids? Go and sort them out. They've got to get out of this apartment. The police were there. They had an hour to get out. I was like, my goodness, is this place going to fall down? It got to that point, I was like, oh my God. 
and I just sat there in vanilla. There's not a lot I can do, is there? It's just like I'm what a long way away, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I just like, okay, Lord, what can I do? I can only trust you. So anyway, we get back from Manila, it's all summer clothes, winter in Sydney, can we get in to get a coat? No. Oh. It's like, I'm like, great, I'm walking around a pair of shorts, you know, and it's freezing. And I was like, all right, no, we have not been able to move back into that place since. Wow. And I was like, and Joe and I were sitting there like, okay. And can we do anything about it? No. Can we, have we got any say in what's gonna happen? Now they're saying, well, we can't sue the people the, the building next door and even if we do we've got to get this thing done and so guess what you've got to pay for it we're like what you are telling the whole of our apartment buildings we have to pay for this like this is not easy people <laughs> this is like at least another hundred thousand dollars per apartment oh, wow. and that's if they fix it and i'm like oh my gosh i mean there's a lot of people up in arms and angry about this as you could imagine but it has given us the opportunity to really be able to say, hey, okay, what do we do? There's nothing we can do. So we actually have been the ones that have just been trying to help as many people as possible just really cope with it. And people are like, why are you taking this so okay? Why, why aren't you just freaking out like everybody else right now? And we're like, well, what can you do? And I'm reading all of the, um, you know, the, the emails. I try not to read too many because it really <laughs> makes you worry. And, I was, and they, all these women are like, I'm up at 4 a.m. and I can't sleep and I don't know what's going to happen. The uncertainty for so many people is just really sad. But I just thought, I sat back and I thought, you know what? God, you are the only one that I can put my hope in. There's no other hope. It's not, I can't, you know, I can say it's in my ability to earn money. No, it's not. What happens if you get sick? I could say, well, it's in, you know, it's in the investment property that we bought. No, it's not. That could burn down. We've just had a billion fires in Sydney that have burnt down properties all over the place. And I'm like, you know what? Well, my life is not certain. There's nothing that I can put my hope in. There's nothing. And I think this year has really taught me so much. Just about, you know, I have nothing. I will, we gave away so much, so much furniture because you know what I was like, what are we going to do with all this? Let's just get rid of it because hey, we may not even have a place to live anymore. But I'm like, okay, I've got my suitcase. We're living in an Airbnb. You know what? Great. I'm just going to enjoy my life because my hope is not in what I have. It's in God. And we have been able to be a light to a lot of people who have come to us even to help them cope with what is going on. And you know what, that has been a big lesson for me this year. Because, I don't know, as a woman, I put my security in money. I felt quite secure having that amount of money in my bank account in case something happened. That oh, it's okay, I've got it. I've got $200,000 in my bank that my mom left me. Not that I'd earned, because I'd already spent all that crap in the world and been crazy. But, you know, I'm just like, you know, there's nothing that we can put our whole in. Because that can easily just go without us even knowing with us making even good decisions. We have no control over what's gonna happen. And that's one big lesson I think I've learned this year, is just that where do I put my hope? My hope is not in what I have. I love Esther. My, her, her hope was not in who she was, in the beauty that she had. Her, her hope was not in, you know, just her position. She didn't let her fears define who she was. She didn't let her beauty define who she was. She put her hope in God, and that was what defined her. Let me encourage you today to look into the Bible, even if you are a Christian. Look deeper into the Bible, because you will face challenging times. You will be tested, as the Bible says we all are. <laughs> you know, but where, where is your hope, really? And it was really cool because our mentor sat down with us and he's like, well, what is God teaching you? I was like, okay, what is God teaching you? Are you, are you being worldly? Are you holding on to worldly things? Or are you putting your security in worldly things? And I thought, wow, this is a time for me to reassess my own heart. To really see what is God teaching me through all this? Because I know God will rescue us. And even if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. We're having a great time. But... Where is my hope today? My hope is in God, and that is what makes us radiant. God is the only answer to living a truly radiant life. 
and a life that makes us secure and happy and goes back to the whole definition of what it means to be radiant is to be happy, to be sparkling, to be shining, to be confident. But what do you put your confidence in? It's true, the true God is the only way to do that. And if, I, if there's anything that has encouraged you today, listening to these amazing young women, you know, share their hearts and their faith and, their, and just what really changed them. If you relate to anything that is said today, God is the answer. And you know, if, if someone asks you to study the Bible, do it. If you don't believe in God, do it. If you do believe in God, do it. If you've been walking with God for a long time, do it. <laughs> because God is there for all of us and He is the one that died so that we could have life and life to the full. Amen.